So he's a professor of computer science at ETH Zurich, <laughs> at the electrical engineering department, but also affiliated with the computer science department. Um, and his research is in computer architecture systems, and uh, as we'll see today, also in bioinformatics. And uh, we are very happy to have him as a keynote presenter because I think uh, the way his group uh, looks at the computer architecture and system subjects, it's really uh, well aligned with how SPMA looks at it. So across the stack and really uh, trying to think about uh, hardware, software, architecture at the same time. Uh, he has also a lot of awards and uh, and various accolades and uh, in interest of time, I'll skip that if that's okay, Onur. Uh, but please, uh, please check out his website. I also know he is very prolific on YouTube, so um, there's a lot of lectures and, and talks uh, that you can find from him. And with that, uh, Onur, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Joel. Just a second. Can you hear me well with my headphones? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, can you hear me well with my headphones on? Hello? I think it's pretty fine. Okay. It, if it's good, I can continue. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, sorry for not being there. I'm uh, still recovering from some cold, and uh, I don't want to infect anyone for sure at this point in time. And uh, thank you for attending. I see a full room. Uh, it's great to see this workshop thriving. I think uh, so. I'm going to talk about accelerating genome analysis. Uh, this is a fascinating topic uh, to me, and there's a lot to do in this area. And I believe we're just scratching the surface at this point, even though we have been working on it for uh, about a decade or so. And I'm going to give you a personal perspective of what we have been doing. Uh, I have a lot more slides than I can potentially cover in the, uh, in the given time uh, at this point. So I'm going to skip some slides, but there's, I'm, uh, I'm happy to share these slides and they'll be available on my website uh, as well. So let's get started. Uh, so I believe system design for bioinformatics is a critical problem, uh, especially today and going forward. It has large scientific, medical, societal, and personal implications. And this talk is about accelerating a key step in bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is a very wide uh, field. Uh, and genome sequence analysis is a very small subset of bioinformatics, but a very important subset. And we're going to focus even more within that important subset uh, to what I call read mapping, or what many people call read mapping. And even within this subset, uh, we will see that there are a lot of interesting uh, system design uh, that we can do. And uh, we will see that many bottlenecks exist in accessing and manipulating huge amounts of genomic data during analysis. And we will cover various ideas, some of them in more detail than others. And this is my also a personal journey since September 2006 or so. And uh, basically, uh, if I have to take you back to that personal journey, this is what we were imagining about 15 years ago. We wanted to have an embedded device that can perform comprehensive genome analysis in real time within a minute. You give it to a doctor or a patient, a random person out in the world, and they do their genome analysis and they figure out something important, basically. Something could be life critical. Something uh, could, be, uh, could have a lot of personal and medical implications they don't need to share with anyone. Uh, basically, some device that can enable many, many things. And that was our dream. Uh, and these are some questions that you can ask the device, right? Which of these DNAs does the segment match with? Uh, potentially, you can do uh, virus outbreak uh, detection and uh, variant detection this way. What is the likely genetic disposition of this patient to this drug? It could be life critical. And what disease or condition might this particular DNA RNA piece uh, associate with? And many, many questions. I'll give you some more examples to motivate. And I believe today we have a bright future. At that time, we didn't have these devices. These devices were introduced in uh, 2014, 2018 timeframe, and they're becoming smaller and smaller. So I believe the technology is on our side, uh, meaning uh, we've been producing these devices. The problem, as I will hopefully uh, show you, is that computational. And we really need to have a system designed to uh, enable these technologies that can sequence genomes extremely fast, reasonably accurately, uh, but we, we, have, we are lagging on analysis, basically. But the bright news is that, just to give you a very, very high-level executive summary, we can achieve hundreds, uh, sometimes even thousands, uh, uh, X speedups uh, compared to existing software and sometimes even compared to existing hardware uh, software co-designs as well but this is not enough basically we need millions and even higher uh, x type of speed ups okay this is the agenda this is an aggressive agenda as i said i'm going to skip uh, some of these things i'm going to pick and choose uh, based on the time constraint but let me introduce the problem first clearly everybody knows about genomes i'm going to go through some of these quickly a genome is essentially a bunch of bases uh, put together and 
essentially it uh, affects everything we do. It affects what we look like. It affects, uh, it's, it's basically the nature part of the nature nurture debate. Uh, uh, and clearly nature has a lot to do with what we do. Nurture also has a lot to do with what we do, but nature uh, also affects uh, how we do nurturing as well. And uh, clearly these are real. Uh, this is actually Henrietta Lacks's uh, genomes that has enabled a lot of research. And uh, despite uh, some privacy, uh, privacy issues, uh, because people took her genome and analyzed it, at that time, privacy constraints were not as important, let's say. But today, we have privacy constraints that are going to be even more important going into the future in genome analysis. And if you look at a genome from a, let's say, computational perspective, it's essentially text. It looks like this. And I'm going to give you the number of characters later on. But it has an alphabet. Uh, it, has, it has four characters in the alphabet. And it has billions of uh, these characters. And some characters are important because you may be searching for something over here. and some. Uh, some uh, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, as is called in bioinformatics, may be very important for disease, for example. And you can see that the size of a genome varies across the species. Uh, humans are somewhere in the middle, as you can see. It's not extremely large, but it's large enough to cause problems uh, for in computation. And in the goal in DNA sequencing or genome sequencing is to uh, really uh, find the complete sequence of AC these characters in an organism's DNA so that you can basically query it in many ways. Unfortunately, there is no machine that takes long DNA as input and gives the complete sequence as output. We haven't figured out that technology yet. All technologies are heterogeneous. All, all sequencing machines are bas basically choppers. They chop DNA into pieces and identify relatively small pieces, but they do not tell you how they fit together. As a result, you have a puzzle at hand. You need to put these things together uh, so that you can actually do interesting analyses on the genome. And basically, this talk is about putting these things together uh, in, a, uh, in a fast and accurate way, because this step is actually taking a lot of time. And so basically, this is a pictorial representation. You have a large DNA molecule. You get small DNA fragments from existing choppers, machines. And uh, these, uh, these are called reads, essentially. And then the function, computational problem is to map these reads to potentially a reference genome so that you can reconstruct uh, what, the, uh, uh, what the sequence genome looks like. And of course, it's not going to be an exact match because there are variations, as we will discuss. And there are also errors in the sequencing machine. Uh, so you will not get an exact match. You will get an approximate match. And you will approximately construct this entire DNA. And to be able to do this more perfectly, you do the sequencing many times. And you build confidence in your approximate construction uh, sometimes you actually uh, do the sequencing 30 times or 100 times so that you, you build a confidence as to what you've constructed is really uh, accurate. And then the, uh, you, you can do interesting analyses like uh, how do I differ uh, from this uh, particular genome? How, how does this gene actually differ from a disease uh, or, uh, or uh, disease-prone gene, let's say, for various diseases? Uh, so this is another uh, pictorial representation over here. Sequencing machine gives you reads, and we're going to map them to a reference genome. And then we're going to uh, look for genomic variants, variations, for example. Uh, and, but let's take a look at the sequencing machine. I, I, I actually uh, liken uh, these to uh, untangling yarn balls. If you have a cat that's playing with many yarn balls, uh, how do you actually figure out uh, the different yarn balls? Basically, you chop. Uh, one, one way of doing it is uh, chopping these yarn balls into pieces and reconstructing each yarn ball. And this is actually a very interesting uh, depiction of many, many possible genomes living together uh, in an organism or in somewhere uh, in the, in the, in the uh, bus, for example, that you're riding. And then you can, uh, you can take a sample from that bus and you can analyze and you can figure out all those other possible genomes that are out there. And then you can do these uh, analyses on microbiomes, for example, that we will briefly talk about also. But these are uh, the real machines that do genome sequencing today. Uh, actually, these are not the old, uh, youngest, uh, let's say, latest ones. All produce data with different properties. That's why the algorithms need to be tight uh, to overcome their limitations. Uh, these are some more recent high-throughput sequences, as you can see. And they come in all sizes. Some of them are extremely expensive, millions of dollars. Some of them are only $1,000 uh, or $2,000 uh, or so. Uh, and uh, clearly, these machines have enabled, earlier versions of these machines have enabled a human genome uh, project, uh, which was a important project that has actually opened the genomic era. And today, we can actually sequence many, many more genomes than we can process. Uh, this is a famous graph that compares Moore's law, uh, the cost of a transistor, compared to the cost of uh, sequencing of a human genome. And you can see that uh, we're at a better, much uh, higher exponential uh, than transistor costs are reducing. 
And you can study these on your own. There's a lot of information about this. And it's because of these high-throughput sequencing machines, basically, that uh, the inflection points have happened when high-throughput sequencing machines have, introduced, have been introduced. And this is where Nanopore uh, has been introduced. And maybe there will be other technological breakthroughs going forward. Uh, who knows? So high-throughput sequencing is very interesting. This is one. Uh, th there's actually a lot of interesting technology that goes into this also. Uh, Illumina's uh, machines, for example, are very much optical imaging based. Uh, they, they have these optical sensors, CMOS sensors, and they have many names. And basically, based on the uh, reaction uh, that they see, uh, chemical reactions, they can actually take an image and they can decide whether uh, the uh, what they do is basically, sorry, they chop the DNA into pieces, very small pieces, and these small pieces are sent onto a glass, glass flow cell, sur cell surface, and they interact, uh, they have some chemical reactions with the material on the surface, and based on those chemical reactions, you can actually uh, detect the images via CMOS sensor, and you can understand uh, what bases are hitting. Uh, that glass flow sur cell surface. It's not a perfect process, but it's reasonably accurate today. It's more than 99% accurate, actually, the identification uh, of these uh, bases. Uh, but unfortunately, the uh, sequences, the, the reads that you get are extremely small because they have to chop it into very small pieces so, so that they can make it accurate. As a result, the puzzle of mapping those small reads to a large genome is uh, difficult. And there's a lot of inter interesting information on it that you can read that I'm going to skip because it's not the subject of this talk. But uh, basically, uh, this is what I said. Uh, you get high throughput, high speed, and low cost, but you get short reads. And uh, you get low error rates, relatively, 99% today, actually. Unfortunately, you don't have a lot of any information about where the reads are coming from. Basically, they're, they're completely randomly chopped, essentially. You do not know how they relate to each other in, in, in the most common technologies, at least. And you do not know which part of the genome uh, they have been cut from, let's say. So essentially, you have a puzzle that kind of looks like this. Uh, bioinformatics people like uh, having acronyms and names. It's actually a field where uh, you, uh, you have a lot of these, uh, let's say, jargon. Uh, I'm trying to stay away. I, I'm, going to try, I'm going to try to stay away from that jargon as much as possible in this talk. But you have a reference genome that you want to map things to. And you have these sequenced reads. And the question is, how do you actually uh, solve the puzzle? If these reads are extremely small, uh, as we all know, puzzles are much harder to solve. Right? If these reads are much longer, puzzles are easier to uh, solve. Of course, this is not a perfect analogy because uh, these reads are not perfectly correct, meaning there are errors in these reads. So the uh, process of solving the puzzle is actually harder than, act than an actual puzzle that you would solve in real life. So newer genome sequencing technologies have different properties. So these uh, nanopore sequences, for example, produce much longer reads, sometimes even on the order of one million base pairs. Unfortunately, their error rates are also higher. So basically, if you uh, have to plot uh, read length and the read accuracy or accuracy of the machines, you get a picture that looks like this today. You have some machines that can produce short reads, very short, 100, 200, 300 base pairs. And remember that a human genome is 3.2 billion base pairs. Uh, but they're very accurate, 99%. Long reads like nanopore, uh, they're much larger, 50,000, let's say, on average. Uh, but their accuracy is much lower on the order of 90%. Uh, now, there are some technologies that are coming up uh, that have reasonably long reads, and they're very accurate, but they're extremely expensive due to the processes that they employ, much more expensive than short read and long read technologies today. But who knows? In the future, these may be also interesting, and they may open up uh, some new avenue. So genome analysis, basically, today, we have these sequencing machines with various properties. And we need to reconstruct the genome that's chopped by these sequencing machines so that we can do interesting analyses on it, like variant calling and scientific discovery and who knows what else, uh, which I will briefly talk about. Uh, but uh, uh, there's been a lot of effort that's spent on uh, these read mapping techniques, which is really the step from taking the sequences and mapping them to a reference genome. Uh, and if you're really interested in a lot of the algorithms and history, we have recently written this uh, review paper that was published in Genome Biology that you can take a look at. And I'm not going to bore you with all of these details. I'm going to give you more recent advances. So why do we care? Uh, very quickly, there are many questions you can ask. If I give you a bunch of sequences, tell me where they're same, where they're different. If you, do, if you did your read mapping correctly, this can give you very interesting uh, scientific answers, potentially. Uh, these are some examples, example from bacteria, I think. Uh, and you can see, you can basically form um, a history of what has happened in the ev evolution of different species. That's one example. You can certainly figure out genetic similarity between species uh, and do potentially interesting analyses, uh, and people are doing that. 
You can find variations that are associated with different traits like blood pressure. Can, there are many, many interesting articles published uh, that are uh, basically correlating different single nucleotide polymorphisms, in particular genes. Uh, these are basically single uh, ba base pair differences to uh, things like blood pressure. It's just one example. And you can do much more larger studies, genome-wide association studies, basically. You can find uh, the genetic variants associated with uh, phenotypes using multiple groups of people. These are much wider studies, as you can see. And you can use this in personalized medicine, clearly, uh, by uh, correlating these, what's called SNPs, uh, with uh, how people respond to different kinds of treatment. Uh, you can basically find the best level of treatment by doing the genome analysis of people who come for treatment. And much larger structural variations, like copy number variations, actually, uh, uh, are shown to uh, correlate with some other diseases or uh, illnesses, as you can see uh, over here, or conditions, as you can see over here. And uh, clearly, there's a lot of application for it. Uh, this is very, uh, these are some really interesting studies that were uh, more recently performed. Uh, you can do basically uh, rapid whole genome sequence analysis in two days and uh, essentially uh, react to critical in infants very quickly, but this is extremely costly. Or you can wait for five days and you can risk uh, some uh, important situations potentially, basically. So there's a lot to talk about here, and it's fascinating, I think, but I would I recommend some readings. This is one reading that I would recommend that talks about how to use structural variations in genomes uh, so that you can actually do interesting decisions. But this is, uh, remember that this is from 2019, so the field is evolving very fast. So there's, uh, there's a very big moving target in bioinformatics and genome analysis. So uh, you can also do uh, a lot of interesting analyses. For example, can you identify different species uh, and, of, of, and genomically unknown al uh, organisms by uh, doing comparisons across many different uh, genomes? This is called metagenomics, for example. Or you can construct the genomes of unknown species. It's called genome assembly or de novo sequencing. Uh, and read mapping still plays a role in these uh, technologies, actually. One of the th interesting th studies that people do is, uh, can we actually identify all of the microbes and microbiomes that are actually out there in a city, for example, uh, by taking samples uh, from the metro stations or b buses or public transportation, essentially. And this is one study that was done in New York. And more recently, people have been trying to construct uh, global metagenomic maps of microbes. It's uh, not, a, not an e easy thing, as you can see, but you can read some papers that people are trying to do. And a lot of effort, a lot of computation time goes into this, actually. Uh, you can, uh, the, these take uh, months, if not years, actually, uh, to study. And uh, you can see that if you, uh, this is one example. Uh, I like this uh, uh, example where people show how much uh, data uh, production uh, increase you will see if you actually analyze many, many more microbiomes, for example, one million microbiomes will get a zeta increase compared to, let's say, today, uh, compared to 1990, let's say, over here. Okay, another interesting question. Clearly, we are living in COVID-19 times, and these sequencers have been extremely useful for analyzing COVID-19 genome and its variants. And you can take a look at some studies related to that. And, but this is not new. I mean, even in past outbreaks like Ebola, sequencers, less portable sequencers were sent uh, to many different places so that you can actually uh, do outbreak uh, analysis. So basically, uh, uh, so, uh, basically there are uh, many, many things you can do you, uh, with faster and scalable genome analysis. And we're very limited by computational power today. Uh, and many, many other applications can be imagined. So I'm going to focus on one problem, as I said, and that's the problem of read mapping, basically. Uh, basically, today we're really bottlenecked by read mapping. Uh, and uh, this is an example of the bottleneck. For example, you can, uh, existing machines, uh, this is actually an older machine, uh, can sequence very well. Essentially, you can get 48 human whole genomes in a, at 30x coverage, meaning 30 times sequencing, in about two days. But if you actually, uh, the bottleneck is really the computational analysis, read mapping of it. In a, in a 48 core processor, you can, you can basically analyze, read map uh, one human genome uh, in 32 CPU hours. I mean, this is one example. Of course, you can throw more resources and you can try to reduce it, uh, but uh, the energy cost and the computational cost actually increases. And the machines are also becoming much more sophisticated. This was 48 a few years ago, like five years ago. It's going to be much faster. Basically, we cannot keep up. Why? Because we have these special purpose machines for fast sequencing, but we're analyzing these uh, data that's generated by these special purpose machines using general purpose machines, essentially. And I think uh, this is a fundamentally bad proposition. Uh, we're not going to be able to keep up with the uh, rate at which uh, these sequencers are going to operate, in my opinion. Uh, and so uh, 
there are many problems associated with this analysis, but the first step you have to do really is to construct the entire genome for many sequence reads because it bottlenecks everything else that comes down the pipeline. And this is what I showed you earlier. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Basically, we're going to talk about read mapping. We're not going to talk about de novo assembly as much, which is uh, the method of merging the reads in order to construct the original sequence. If you don't have a reference genome, how do you construct it, which is fascinating. There are a lot of algorithmic issues, system level issues over there, but algorithms are actually relatively uh, uh, not well developed over there. We're going to talk about more, uh, more read mapping, where you actually align the reads as against the no reference genome to detect matches and variations down uh, in the pipeline so that you can do interesting analyses. Uh, assembly is also very interesting, but we don't have time to talk about it. So I think I already defined read mapping. You have this DNA, you chop it into pieces, and you want to align it to a reference genome, which is much, much larger than the pieces itself, with some differences allowed. Because you may have uh, errors in chopping, and you may have variations between the, uh, this DNA of the individual and the reference genome that you're aligning to, essentially. And uh, remember that this is, uh, there are many uh, of these uh, short reads. And uh, this problem becomes uh, bigger if you have metagenomic analyses. Basically, if you want to map to many known reference genomes, for example, and this happens when you actually recover uh, direct uh, genetic material from environmental samples, and you basically chop them into reads. You don't necessarily know the colors, basically, when you chop them. And then you try to uh, map them to a reference database where you have mil potentially millions of reference genomes tried so that you can understand what's going on uh, in, a, in a swab that you've taken in the city, for example. OK, so execution time of read mapping old times uh, has been alignment, uh, meaning uh, the edit distance computation that you need to do to uh, do string uh, se sequence alignment between multiple strings occupies a lot of the time. This is still mostly true, but we're, we've, we've tried to reduce it a lot, basically. So uh, from a computer perspective, you have these text files, essentially, which is the reference genome, and you have a read, for example. Your goal is really to uh, map uh, the read to a location that may uh, that the read may match to. You can see that blue, uh, green, and red appear in sequence only in one place in this reference genome or part of this reference genome, as you can see. And you should not be fooled by other appearances of green, uh, yellow, and blue uh, because the read is a bit longer uh, than individual pieces of uh, that you can see over here. Okay, so you need to do some uh, comparisons base by base, uh, which we will talk about. And uh, the, the main algorithm, there are many versions of this uh, algorithm, edit distance computation, is really the minimum distance uh, number of edits, insertions, deletions, uh, or substitutions needed to make the read exactly match the reference segment. So this is an example from Netherlands and Switzerland. You can have matches, deletions, insertions, mismatches, as you can see over here. So what are the challenges over here? Basically, you need to find many mappings of each read because a read may come from many potential places in a reference genome, and you want to figure out what potential places actually map uh, to the reference genome. Uh, how can we find all mappings efficiently? You need to tolerate small variances and errors in each read. Each individual is different. Machines are also uh, erroneous. How can we efficiently map each read with up to some number of errors present, this E? And this E is increasing, actually, today, because some high-throughput sequencing technologies that are new have a large error rate, like 10%, 15%. And if this E increases, algorithms actually become uh, much, uh, the computations become much uh, more complex. And you need to map each read very fast. Performance is basically important. How can we design a much higher performance read mapper, especially with the metagenomic analyses, for example? So why is this slow? Traditionally, this has been done using dynamic programming algorithms. And there have been many examples of uh, edit distance computation. I'm not going to go through it. We don't have time. But it's essentially dynamic programming. And uh, dynamic programming essentially is hard especially when your string sizes grow. But even, if, even with smaller string sizes, like 100 base pairs, this is uh, not easy. Uh, OK, and if you're interested, you can certainly go through these slides or lectures. But there are also very interesting theoretical papers that uh, basically show that you cannot do this in subquadratic time. Uh, and and uh, clearly, people have developed a lot of effort to improve dynamic programming, some of which we, have co we cover in this uh, particular survey. I'm not going to talk about those. So over time, basically, people develop mappers that, can, that are much more sophisticated than just dynamic programming. As a result, uh, today, we've kind of reduced uh, the sequence alignment to 60 to 70%. Depends on what genome you're uh, doing. But those are due to techniques that are discussed in the survey, for example, and some of the things that we discuss uh, in this particular work, which I will uh, talk about in the remaining part of this talk, essentially. OK, so as I said, this is an aggressive agenda. I'm going to pick and choose uh, from uh, now on. I will briefly talk about state-of-the-art read mapper design and then talk about some acceleration methods uh, in, at the system level. I'll try to focus more on the system, uh, like hardware, software, co-design, 
But I'll give you the key ideas of algorithmic acceleration as well, and then conclude essentially. So there are read mapping algorithms. There are two major styles. Uh, a lot of them are hash table based. Some of them are uh, FM index based, compressed. Uh, usually, hash table based uh, algorithms are quite sensitive, but uh, th there's a trade off essentially. There's no perfect algorithm for designing read mapping uh, tables, I would say. Uh, but uh, l let me give you an example of how one style operates. Uh, so you pre-process the reference genome into a hash table and use this hash table to map reads. Essentially, you form an index of the reference genome. And you divide uh, this index based on k-mers. These are strings of length k. 12 is an example. And basically, uh, form an index of where this k-mer appears in the reference genome. And this is your hash table, essentially, where each of these k-mers, potential k-mers, appear in the reference genome. Some of them may not appear. So this is, these are called location lists, basically. And you do this once for a reference. And then you use this hash table for mapping reads. Whenever you get a read, in this particular case, you have 36 base pairs. You chop it into these k-mers, index the hash table, figure out the locations, read the reference genome in that location, and compare the read, uh, to that, uh, compare the read that was sequenced uh, to the reference genome in that location. Compare meaning approximate string matching, in this uh, particular case, edit distance computation, basically. So if you do it like this for every single location, then it becomes uh, unbearable, meaning it's, uh, it's extremely slow in the end. So people play a lot of tricks to get rid of locations to compare. They basically uh, look at properties of the hash table where these different strings appear or not appear. And based on that, they basically get rid of the uh, alignment uh, that they need to do. OK, so that's the key idea. Sometimes they don't match, sometimes they do match, but ideally, if something is not matching, you, you should avoid the computation. You should avoid the cost the edit distance computation on that particular part of the reference genome, even though your index may say, oh, this may potentially match. Right? So ideally, you would like to filter out the non-matching parts of the reference genome. OK, that's called an invalid mapping, basically. I'm going through this relatively quickly because uh, these are relatively old, let's say. Uh, but uh, if you haven't seen by, uh, genome analysis uh, at all before, uh, th these are some of the fundamentals also. So basically, uh, there are many mappers. This is one example mapper that we have uh, devised, uh, which is guaranteed to find all mappings. It's very sensitive, which is good because you do not lose any information. It can tolerate many errors. But the speed is a big, big problem, basically, in these mappers in general. Uh, okay. So basically, you have poor performance of existing read mappers. Verification alignment takes too long to execute. And this is one example in the past before the techniques uh, that we and others have developed. Uh, the goal is really to speed up the mapper by reducing the cost of the verification. An overarching key idea, uh, I will spend a lot of the time on this one, is to filter fast before you do the edit distance computation or alignment. Minimize this costly dynamic programming algorithms, essentially. So this is the key idea. If you, ha you have sequenced reads coming out of a machine, uh, quickly determine whether they are s potentially similar to the reference or too dissimilar to the reference. If they're too dissimilar to the reference based on your filtering heuristics, quickly find them and filter them out without costly computation. And focus the processing power on things that are potentially similar to the reference. Maybe do dynamic programming. Ideally, you would avoid that as much as possible, of course. Uh, but the key question over here is uh, you should not filter out something that's going to be similar to the reference. And you should try to, as much as possible, uh, filter out things that are not going to be similar to the reference. And uh, this uh, paper itself concerns, uh, covers a lot of techniques that are out in the field. I'm going to focus on some of them. So algorithmic acceleration actually looks at uh, the structure of the genome, as well as uh, potentially SIMD instructions, for example, uh, to design different algorithms for this purpose. And hardware acceleration basically does algorithm and hardware co-design. So let's take a look at uh, some examples over here. So you can do things purely in software. Uh, basically, uh, the realization here is that most edit distance computation calculations are often unnecessary. If you look at this mapper, uh, actually one out of 1,000 potential locations uh, passes the verification process, meaning they're similar to the reference genome. Remaining 999 ones are not. That's why uh, we can actually get rid of unnecessary verification calculations by somehow quickly detecting and rejecting early invalid mappings. It's called filtering and reducing the number of potential mappings you can examine. And you can do this by exploiting the structure of the uh, uh, genome, for example. So for example, adjacent k-mers in the read should also be adjacent in the reference genome. You can do this by pre-processing the hash table and figuring this out. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this actually eliminates a lot of the uh, edit distance computations. The second observation are uh, some k-mers are uh, more frequently appearing in the reference genome. Some k-mers are less frequently appearing. Uh, Focus on those things that are less frequently appearing. Because if you have a k-mer, uh, 
in, 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 a, in a read, if you actually look at the less frequently appearing ones, you will examine fewer location lists, fewer locations of the reference genome. And that's the idea. But of course, errors complicate this problem. Uh, if you actually need to tolerate E errors in terms of Bay pairs, you need to, uh, based on the pigeonhole principle, you need to examine E plus 1 k-mers. So you need to be very careful uh, when you're doing this so that you don't miss some mappings. So this paper introduces two of these ideas that I just mentioned. Uh, again, I don't, uh, I don't have a lot of time to go over this, but you can study these pictorial representations. So basically, uh, adjacency filtering says that adjacent k-mers in the read should be adjacent to the reference genome. And figure this out by processing the hash table that I showed you earlier, because many of these mappings are invalid, as you can see. Even though one or two k-mers match in the reference genome, potentially match, uh, the other k-mer doesn't match. Uh, so you should really focus on this one uh, to compare. And you can do this by processing the hash table, as we discussed. OK, I'll go through this quickly, since we don't have a lot of time in this particular talk. Uh, OK, and the cheap camera selection says, uh, basically, uh, you have, uh, this is, let's say, this is your read. And uh, different camers have different frequencies in the reference genome. Uh, and your goal is really to find the camers, uh, fi find the read in the reference genome, because uh, you, you need to have enough camers aligning to the reference genome. Don't focus on the expensive ones. Focus on the cheap ones. And if you do that, uh, you can actually examine much fewer locations than uh, past works exam. And the end result, uh, using real uh, data, real systems, is you can get basically an order of magnitude speed up. Uh, in the best case, we saw to 19x speed up compared to existing systems purely by software and exploiting the structure of the human genome. And basically, you can get rid of 99% of the mappings, as you can see. OK, so there's a lot more on this, and people have been using this. Uh, this is one of the filtering heuristics. There are many filtering heuristics, as I said. Uh, I will briefly talk about software hardware co-designs. Uh, I will mention uh, one thing that's actually interesting. Uh, basically, uh, filtering is different from uh, edit distance computation, because your goal is to quickly figure out whether you can filter something out. So this can be approximate. And as long as it doesn't falsely filter out matching uh, uh, locations, then you're fine. Uh, but you need to do it quickly. Uh, so you can actually play a lot of tricks to do it quickly. And this is, the key idea over here is that if two strings differ by E edits, then every base pair match can be aligned in at most two E shifts. This may be cryptic, but you will see an example. Uh, basically, the insight is that shifting a string by one corrects for one error. So why not actually do hamming distance of strings that are shifted from each other? And the key idea is shifted hamming distance, as I said. Uh, and uh, basically, you can, you can map this to bit parallel operations that nicely map to SIMD instructions and later FPGAs. GPUs, as well as um, uh, in-memory processing engines. And the key result is that this is actually much faster than the best implementation of the, basically the best implementation of bit vectors that are used uh, previously. So let me give you an uh, insight over here. So these are two strings. Clearly, uh, there are uh, eight matches and zero mismatches. They're equal. If you actually delete one character over here, uh, it basically becomes a costly edit distance computation. And it looks like you have three matches, five mismatches. Uh, but if you really wanted to compute the edit distance, that's not correct, basically. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we, we're actually going to do something else than edit distance. We're, we're not going to use dynamic programming because we want to do quick filtering. Uh, so we actually, to cancel the effect of this deleted character, we need to shift in the right direction. So how do you do that, basically? Uh, you basically shift this in the right direction and do another comparison. So uh, this is the non-shifted version. You get three matches. This is the shifted version, shifted by, to the right by one. You get four matches over here. And then if you end them, uh, OK, basically XORs uh, do the comparison. And the ends after that, end of the re results of the XORs, uh, give you uh, something else over here. And then you count the ones over here. Basically, that, those ones tell you that you have one mismatch and seven matches. And this could be your filter, basically. Uh, of course, this is just one example, right? The, what we do is you compute these uh, Hamming masks. These are ha Hamming masks, and we call these shifted Hamming masks, let's say. Uh, for uh, every number of deletions uh, and uh, insertions you examine. So if you want to actually have an edit distance threshold, error threshold of E, you need to have two E plus one vectors that you compute this for. But this is an easy computation, XOR, shifted XOR uh, of uh, the different strings. And then you can actually do an end of those uh, so that uh, you, can, uh, you can do the computation. Uh, you can basically guess uh, whether... Uh, whether uh, uh, there, there, uh, yes, the approximate number of matches and mismatches. Okay, okay. So there's a lot more that goes into this. Uh, there's an example that over here that I'm not going to go into. But you need to play some tricks also because sometimes you get spurious ones, etc. And later work actually try to reduce it. But the key realization is that this is not dynamic programming. Right? Dynamic programming is costly, as we have discussed. But right now you're doing XORs, uh, shifts, XORs, and ends essentially. 
And this is highly parallel. You can basically map it to SIMD instructions, which we did in this particular work because you don't have any data dependencies. Uh, you can map it to uh, GPUs. You can map it to FPGAs. And you, you, what you really want to do is the longest streaks of zeros and combine them uh, and then guess uh, how, many, uh, uh, how many zeros and how many ones you have at the end of uh, this uh, shift XOR and end operations. OK, so later works basically, uh, I'm, I'm talking about this in more detail because later works uh, looked at using this algorithmic idea, improving it, and mapping it to FPGAs, GPUs, and processing in memory engines in various ways. Uh, uh, and I'm not going to go through that in detail, but it's, it's all based on this key idea of shift to timing distance, I will say. OK, so what, if, you, if you actually do this, you get significant speed ups, as I mentioned. Uh, and the bottleneck shifts, basically. The new bottleneck in read mapping becomes a filtering pre-alignment step as opposed to this alignment step. And a lot of work actually focused on improving that filtering step. Uh, so let's take a look at that quickly. Uh, so ideally, how you would do this filtering is uh, you would like to filter out most incorrect mapping, mappings, preserve all correct mappings, uh, and do this quickly. The question is, how do you do it? And this is where a lot of system design has, went, uh, has gone into. I'm not going to go into details, but this is a pictorial example of it in a hash table. Uh, basically, you have many, many locations that particular uh, KMER matches in the reference genome. And the filter's job is to ensure that you don't examine uh, the mismatching locations. If you examine a mismatching location, this is a false accept. Filter did not do a great job, let's say. Uh, but hopefully, those are minimized in the end. And as I said, uh, the key is to make this process really fast by eliminating as many data dependencies as possible and potentially data movement as much as possible as well. So we did a lot of work on FPGA-based filtering. This is one example of it. Uh, this is a, an implementation of the shifted timing distance in FPGAs. And shifted timing distance actually fits very nicely to FPGAs. It's the same algorithm adapted for FPGAs. Uh, the details are in the paper. But basically, uh, it's, in the end, it's data bottleneck because you consume very small amount of the FPGA resources. Uh, but even then, you get actually a much faster filter and overall an order of magnitude speed up in read mapping. And you can try it uh, for yourself. These are all uh, openly available. And you can actually implement, uh, incorporate the FPGA-based filtering in the sequencers as well. And sequencers have more recently been in incorporating more analysis engines like this. OK, uh, so there are more accelerators that try to make it more accurate. So accuracy is always a trade-off. So you need to basically ensure that the filter uh, doesn't lead to a lot of mismatches in the end. Uh, but then uh, filtering, uh, this filtering uh, and edit distance computation go hand in hand. You don't want to make one of them, one of them the bottleneck uh, as much as possible, of course. So the question is, can we do better? How can we do faster, more accurate, more scalable pre-aligned filtering? And this is where algorithm architecture device co-design comes in, uh, in my opinion. And we need to look even further in algorithms, uh, architectures, and devices. Let me give you quickly some key ideas. So Shuji is an interesting idea, uh, which where we observe that correct alignment always includes long identical subsequences. Uh, sorry, this is going a bit uh, slow for some reason. If you want to process the entire sequence, like do a 100 base pair to 100 base pair comparison, that's actually not very good. The idea here is to use overlapping sliding window to quickly and accurately find all long identical subsequences between two strings. And uh, if you do that, again, this algorithm hardware co-design, we, we can do this uh, with uh, FPGAs again. You can get significant speed ups, uh, as you can see over here. So this is a nice example. You can see two species. This is the entire genomes, but you can think of this as two leads also. This is what I mean by long identical subsequences. Basically, there are some parts that are matching blue and red, but some long identical subsequences are the really matching ones. And you would really like to understand and figure them out. Uh, OK, I will uh, not go through this in detail. But as, as I said, this is the uh, comparison of the two strings. And these are the uh, shifted timing masks, if you will. Uh, by shifting one string and doing the XOR comparison, you get these zeros and ones. Zero means matching. One means not matching. And ideally, you would like to find the longest sequence of zeros. In this particular work, we take a, uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, a sliding window approach. We look at window size of four, for example. Uh, and try to find the longest sequence matches, and then slide the window after we find that, and then accumulate what we find, uh, meaning all the zeros, longest subsequence of zeros. Here, you don't have any matches, as you can see. As a result, you need to accumulate a 1 over here. And then you keep doing this. You basically keep sliding through these strings, uh, through, the, through these uh, bit vectors. Uh, basically, you, you, you post-process the bit vectors that you have generated, and then look at this outcome over here. And that outcome basically tells you 
uh, whether you have enough matches or mismatches, and that's your filter, essentially. And this is very effective. This is proven to be very effective. Of course, window size is important. Your window size needs to be large enough uh, so that you have lower false positives, uh, so don't uh, accept. And we have a hardware implementation of this that's very much amenable to lookup tables. So that's not the most recent algorithm. I'll give you the most recent algorithm, which is actually quite interesting, I think, because you can map this longest, sub longest sequence of non-overlapping long matches problem to something very interesting via LSI chip layout, which is a single net routing problem, which is essentially the same thing, I would say, if you think about it in one way. You basically have pins, input pins, and then output pins. And you would like to find out the fastest way or least obstacled way of routing one signal from the input to the output, essentially. And uh, I'll, I'll quickly go over this. But if you do this nicely, you actually get much higher speed ups. You, you get four orders of magnitude more accuracy, as well as uh, large acceleration uh, compared to existing uh, software mappers uh, in both FPGAs and GPUs as well as CPUs. So let me give you the idea quickly. Basically, it's all ones and zeros again. These are the diagonals showed in different ways. What we would like to do is we would like to see this as a layout problem. Uh, so if you block out ones as blacks because those are opticals, if uh, zeros are matches, you would like to find the longest sequence, subsequence of matches until you get to an obstacle, and then you we want to find the next longest subsequence, and then you want to find the next longest subsequence, given an error threshold, of course, a, a tolerable number of errors. So that's the entrance, that's the exit. You can think of this as your chip, and your snake goes into it, finds the longest subsequence, and then hits an obstacle, uh, reduces the uh, error count a bit, and then you basically uh, figure out the next longest subsequence, and then reduce the error count after you hit an obstacle, and then you figure out the next longest subsequence, and then you reach the exit. And that's your uh, pre-alignment filter at this point. And you don't need to build the entire uh, matrix that I've shown you. You can actually build it incrementally. Uh, that actually reduces the storage cost significantly as well. And a FPGA resource analysis is actually very small because usually you're bottleneck by memory, as I will discuss in a little bit. And these are the key results of this algorithm. This actually uh, works for both long reads as well as short reads, as you can see uh, in the paper. Uh, I'm going through this very quickly because I want to talk about processing in memory, and then uh, I will uh, stop. So this I'm going to skip over here. There are actually very interesting uh, other ideas, like approximate string matching. Uh, this is one work that we did where we actually designed a specialized accelerator for approximate string matching. Uh, again, this, we, t we take a, an algorithm that was actually devised in the 1990s. It doesn't fit very well uh, just software, but it fits very well if you design a hardware accelerator for it. This algorithm is called the BITAP algorithm. Uh, and it's, it's used for approximate string matching in our uh, design because we modify it and we make it highly parallel. And we design an accelerator that's mostly systolic array-based. Uh, and this can actually do, uh, again, this is based on the bit vector idea that we discussed, but it's a different kind of bit vector. It fits very well the hardware. And then you actually can get the optimal alignment by actually having a traceback accelerator as well. Sorry, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this if you're really interested. I, I find this fascinating, but uh, I cannot really, uh, let's say, uh, uh, talk about it in detail. And the key result, uh, so basically, you can design this accelerator in FPGA or, or uh, ASIC. And we actually did an ASIC process. And you can see that the overheads are relatively low. And uh, uh, you can actually employ this approximate string matching accelerator in many parts of the genome analysis pipeline. And uh, it fits nicely, let's say. So you can do read alignment, pre-alignment filtering, edit distance calculation. You can, you can do perfect edit distance calculation with this, actually. Uh, and you can get significant performance improvements compared to uh, existing software and hardware algorithms. So it, I mean, there are some, uh, let's say, absurd speed ups uh, depending on the input sets, as you can see. But this is really just pure software, basically. If you really compare it to state-of-the-art hardware, you can get still significant speed up and less power. And I think this uh, shows that there is a lot of potential for improvement. And I will, I will argue that these speed ups are not enough, basically. OK, let me talk about processing in memory. Basically, everything I discussed is really heavily bottlenecked by data movement in the end, unfortunately. All of these ideas. And uh, processing in memory and storage can alleviate this bottleneck, but we need to design mapping and filtering algorithms to fit processing in memory. And I think uh, this is also fascinating because it requires an across-the-stack design. I will give you two examples very quickly, and I will skip one of them, which is not as quick. So we've been looking at, again, FPGA-based near-memory acceleration of uh, uh, pre-alignment filtering, as well as other applications like weather modeling. Uh, and uh, the idea is to perform read mapping uh, using specialized logic near memory. And we carefully redesigned the accelerated logic of Sneaky Snake. If you remember, that's the VLSI chip routing. Uh, uh, we reduced the pre-alignment filtering to VLSI chip routing problem. And we actually map it to an FPGA that uh, uses high bandwidth memory. Uh, and we, can, we see basically see significant speed ups, as you can see, compared to a pretty hefty IBM Power 9 CPU. And uh, 
in this particular work, we examine not only genome analysis, but also weather modeling and multiple different technologies, multiple different communication technologies. And we did this work together with IBM. That's why we use this uh, IBM and OCAP -E protocol, as you can see. And the paper is a lot more detailed, but I, uh, the, the improvements, uh, even with existing systems, it's a real system, is, uh, in my opinion, quite fascinating. Okay, and that's the paper that has more detail. So I'm going to skip uh, this one. This is also very interesting, but I don't really have time. Uh, this is an algorithm and hardware co-designed PIM system for uh, pre-alignment, processing and memory system for pre-alignment filtering, but I do not have time. I will briefly talk about uh, the latest work uh, that we have done that has appeared in uh, ASPLOS, uh, which I think is very important to examine also, especially with metagenomic analyses that require many, 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 many uh, genomes that you can process. I even th then, memory is not enough, basically. You really need to go into storage. And that's uh, what we did over here, basically. Uh, essentially, you still need to bring a lot of uh, the genome from the storage to the computation unit, even if you have a specialized accelerator. Uh, uh, so you have both computation overhead and data moment overhead. We want to basically get rid of that data moment overhead from storage as much as possible. So today, people employ a lot of heuristics, accelerators, filters, etc to reduce the computation overhead, but the data moment overhead from the storage remains, essentially. And that's what we wanted to tackle in this work. And the idea is very simple, basically. Why not do the filtering inside the storage system? And uh, of course, you need to be careful when you do this filtering right now. Uh, you have some filtered reads that do not communicate to the computation units, only communicate things that are potentially going to be useful to examine by the computation units. So what can you filter out? Basically, if something exactly matches uh, the reference genome, you do not need to send it to uh, the computation unit because you can quickly figure that out, hopefully, with simple algorithms in the storage system. Or if something doesn't, is not going to match, again, non-matching, uh, uh, then you can also skip uh, the computation. And that's the idea over here. We designed two different filtering algorithms, one for detecting exactly matching reads and the other for detecting non-matching reads, safely non-matching reads, I should say. Uh, and this uh, caters to different technologies as well as different use cases. Uh, the paper discusses the use cases. And in the end, uh, you need to design it carefully because use cases are different. Read mapping workloads exhibit different behavior. And there's still limited hardware resource in the storage system. We didn't want to modify the flash translation layer significantly. We wanted to basically make this uh, ad uh, adoptable, let's say, relatively easily today. And uh, basically, this way, we, we hopefully solve the computation overhead uh, using accelerators over here and also some accelerators over here, and hopefully reduce the data moment overhead significantly. And uh, we get significant speed ups compared to existing systems. And the speed ups actually increase when you have a computational accelerator uh, on this side because that exacerbates the data moment bottleneck because if your computation is cheap, data moment becomes a bigger fraction of your system uh, performance. OK, and that's the uh, last thing I wanted to talk about. If you're really interested in processing in memory, there, I, uh, there's a lot more fascinating things going on in this area. And I recommend uh, you take a look at some papers and presentations as well. I'm not, unfortunately, going to talk about future opportunities because I think we're already out of time. Uh, but let me mention several things. Uh, so fu future opportunities are both technologies and applications, in my opinion. Technologies are extremely exciting, like nanopore technology is very interesting today. I believe hi-fi technologies are going to be even more interesting when they become less costly. But there's always, uh, I think, uh, I believe in technology. I think there's a lot of improvement in technology that can happen going into the future. Uh, and even if we can actually get the perfect genome sequencing device that gives you the full reference genome, I think we will still have a lot of computational uh, uh, issues because Still, mapping a 3.2 billion base pair uh, uh, sequence that you get from a machine to another 3.2 billion base pair with differences allowed is still a computational problem. Maybe it's a slightly easier or transformed computational problem, but it's still a computational problem. But we're not there yet in technology. In applications, I think we're looking at a lot of graph genomes. This is a work that we have, we've been doing on uh, using graph uh, representations of genomes and doing the acceleration, again, using algorithm hardware co-design. This is coming up at ISCA 2022. I'm happy to talk about it separately. And there are also reference genomes are being updated also uh, quite significantly today. So reference genome is not something static. It keeps changing. And even more recently, a human reference genome was finally uh, mostly, let's say, uh, decoded. I would say, even though that mostly is, not, is still debatable, in my opinion. But basically, we can actually update the reference genome uh, a lot today. The question is, how can you reduce the computation overhead uh, when you actually update the reference genome? And you've already mapped uh, some of the reads to a, a previous version of the reference genome. Can you actually lift some of those updates that you've done 
and actually use them without doing the complete remapping again and again and again. And this becomes a problem, especially in the field, for example. You have a lot of reference genomes and you want to compare to. And you've already done a lot of processing to actually uh, do some comparison. Can you actually reuse some of the computation results that you've actually done uh, and uh, reduce the computation time, improve the energy efficiency, et cetera? Okay. So I'm, as I said, I'm going to skip uh, the rest of that, but I'm going to conclude uh, at the end. There's more information in these slides, as you can find. Uh, okay, uh, so let me conclude over here. Uh, so recall, this was our dream when I started uh, this talk. We wanted an embedded device that can perform comprehensive geno genome analysis in real time within a minute, or even less, uh, if you want to be even more aggressive. I believe we still have a long ways to go, but we've gone some way, let's say. We still need to solve a lot of energy efficiency issues, performance issues that we've been looking at. There's more security and privacy issues. And I believe we have a huge memory bottleneck in all of these. I should say memory in general, uh, memory and storage bottleneck in general, communication bottleneck if you want to be even more general. Basically, we don't want to generate a lot of data in the field and ship it to huge data centers all over the world and create, let's say, a huge churn in terms of energy, performance, security, and privacy, basically. We want to do the processing on site as much as possible and minimize efficient, uh, maximize efficiency, minimize perform, uh, maximize performance, and minimize security and privacy issues. So to conclude, uh, we covered recent ideas in accelerating read mapping, a very small fraction of bioinformatics, and it's re it's small but important fraction of genome sequence analysis. And I believe many future opportunities exist. Uh, we just need to uh, be on the lookout, and I think we need to think across the stack uh, more broadly uh, for both new sequencing technologies and new application use cases. And uh, this is the future I see, basically, much more uh, edge-oriented and uh, much more computation in these devices uh, that are much more powerful. Basically, we, we need to be more intelligent in these devices. So there are more resources. I mentioned some of them. You can take a look at them if you're interested. Uh, we actually have some courses that are covering processing in memory and genomics. More recently, we go into a lot more detail on some of these techniques. I will acknowledge funding that we received that has enabled uh, a lot of this work. And more, more, most importantly, I'll acknowledge me, my group who has done uh, this work uh, collaboratively with our uh, collaborators of, uh, as well. So you can find all of these papers, talks, and artifacts uh, online at various places. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, sorry I couldn't be uh, there, but I, I'm happy to stay and uh, uh, entertain any questions. Uh, yes, yes, it's, it's quite well. So if, uh, maybe... I can repeat the question for you. So, any questions from the room? Yeah. Uh, so, I have a question. So, that uh, you, so your group had very wide scope, but it missed one thing uh, that uh, this is computations on distributed systems. Is there a reason for that? Is it like a really hard <laughs> parallel? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, it, it, did, it did not specifically, I did not specifically talk about that, but uh, certainly uh, a lot of genome analysis today happens in data centers, right? You, you can parallelize this. Uh, and what happens, for example, with the nanopore sequencing devices that are used in the field, you cannot process the data uh, on, the, on the device. You cannot process it on the laptop in a reasonable way if you want to compare it to many, many things, for example. Then you have to send it to a data center and distributed system. And that's the state of the art today, I believe, I, I would say, in genome uh, sequencing. But I would argue that that's very costly because you really need to uh, move the data all over the world uh, to do this processing. Uh, and also, uh, it's a general purpose device in the end. Uh, the sequencing devices are actually getting much, much more powerful uh, than, in my opinion, the distributed systems are scaling. So, uh, for example, the picture that I showed you, you can do 48 uh, genomes in two days. And you can do the analysis uh, in 32 CPRs. That's, I mean, you can consider that uh, kind of like a distributed system. You can scale it up. Yes, you can. You can basically multiply uh, the number of genomes that you can process, and you can also uh, scale the distributed system that that processes it. And that's a valid way of doing it today. But I don't believe that that's a, that's an efficient and uh, lowest latency way, especially if you want to do this on re in real time. But that's a very good question. There, there there's work that covers like cloud computing and distributed systems uh, in genome analysis. And we should also improve the efficiency of it if you would like to keep shipping things to the cloud. And, uh, and this is, uh, there's also benefits to cloud, right? If you don't want to do things real time, if you want to basically progressively analyze something, cloud is a great fit for that purpose, right? Uh, potentially. Okay. Sure. Any other questions from the room?
Yes, please go ahead. So does confidential um, computation play a role in the privacy issue? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'm not uh, so certainly I uh, I believe yes, but unfortunately there's not a lot of work uh, in this topic. So people are looking at privacy preserving techniques uh, to do uh, the querying genome analysis. Uh, but I think when I when you said confidential computation, maybe you are you are thinking more about uh, let's say hardware support for it. Uh, at least that's my, my 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 mindset. That so certainly people are looking at privacy preserving techniques uh, so that you cannot figure out which genomes or which sequences are being processed and that's a big issue in genome privacy uh, studies uh, so it does play a role existing systems uh, incorporate some of those principles but maybe we need to be even uh, more even more private at the lowest levels of the hardware for example so those are some those are some issues that i kind of put into into uh, security and privacy, but certainly uh, uh, we need to be careful in terms of privacy. And that's one, uh, to, to tie it back to the other question, that's one of the reasons why people are quite hesitant to actually share their data with distributed systems, clouds, for example. How do you ensure that uh, your data doesn't get uh, uh, exposed to privacy problems? So maybe uh, I will ask the next presenter to just start setting up the laptop. And uh, maybe if there's one more question, I have one myself, but maybe if there's one from the room. Uh, so I'll ask, so it, it's more like a meta question, Onur. So this, it sounds like, you know, any work like this, which is in the intersection of computer science and, and other areas, uh, it might be challenging for students to get into or, you know, to, to stay in, so to say. So any thoughts on how, you know, how your collaborators, how your students, have faced kind of challenges, but also benefited from working across uh, disciplines? Yeah, that's a, that's a great meta question, uh, Joel. Uh, and I agree, basically. I think uh, uh, basically uh, challenges, uh, there are a lot actually. I mean, bioinformatics is actually a very wide field. As I, uh, as I alluded to, there's a lot of jargon in it. Getting into it takes some time. Uh, but uh, it, 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 it requires developing a culture, I would say, uh, where uh, you, uh, you, have, uh, you get into it. So, so collaborations it matters a lot. We do, we do actually very large collaborations. In some of the genome collaborations, you can see like thousands of authors. Uh, that doesn't happen in systems in general. Uh, that happens here because you cannot really solve the entire puzzle by yourself. So collaboration is extremely important. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, you need to study both fields, and there is no easy way of getting into either one, I would say. So, for example, some of my students have uh, the background, some of them have graduated uh, also. Uh, some of them started with a background in uh, molecular biology, and over time they learned uh, systems, uh, and they got computer science degrees in the end. Some of my other students are the opposite, basically. They started, they came, they come from electrical engineering and they learn micro, uh, like molecular biology issues. Uh, so it requires, I think, this uh, synergy and uh, melting of uh, people who work on a common, let's say, goal. And they, uh, they help each other that way. Uh, I don't have a great answer to this, but uh, in the end, uh, you cannot know everything, in my opinion. It's much harder than a much more focused field. Uh, so you need to have good collaborations that enable you to learn faster uh, and also do better uh, work by understanding the problems.